say in the referendum of this uh, third stage, and to, well, yes, I accepted the invitation to, uh, to, uh, to contribute to the campaign just a little. And I'll take it from uh, where George left it. I think that many of the uh, campaigners for Brexit have it right on one thing. It is about democratic sovereignty. Absolutely. But what is democratic sovereignty? It is the ability for societies to make the decisions that shape their future. Now, if I look at this century, what do we have as challenges? Well, we have climate change, resource exhaustion, so we need to fit our development model within the biophysical limits of this planet. No little challenge. We have to fight terrorism and organized crime. We have to meet the challenge of mass uh, refugees and migration. We have to meet the challenge and to curb absolute corporate power. Now, I'm coming from a small country, so it's quite natural to me to say, well, you know, it's not little Belgium that will be able to face those challenges on its own. So actually, my view is that it's only together that we can really have a chance of regaining democratic sovereignty. It's together. And so the first argument would be to say, okay, well, you imagine small, so that's natural, but we are great Britain. So, well, we can do it. What you guys can't do, well, we can. Well, I would argue that it's not because you have a couple of uh, trident summaries that you are significantly stronger to face all challenges. And let me just talk about corporate power. At this moment, major corporations are playing one state against the other. They, they have us waging, for instance, a tax war against one another. And you know who wins by that? Well, their shareholders, but not our countries. Of course, Great Britain, or Little Belgium, may believe that we can outsmart the others in terms of tax competition. But actually, the only winners are the shareholders, not the taxpayers, not the little taxpayers. And our secret weapon is market access. If we Europeans, condition access to our market to respecting a number of fiscal, social, environmental rules, I can tell you no worldwide multinational will then disregard the European market if they don't like the rules that we apply. So it's really about democratic sovereignty. But then comes the second objection. Yeah, democratic, democratic. But we, we see that it's the multinationals writing the law in Brussels. Is it so? Who is adopting the laws in Brussels? <laughs> Two bodies. European Parliament, elected by the very same people who elect, for instance, the MPs in Westminster. So it's not a, not a category of citizens voting for us MPs. It's exactly the same people. And what's the second institution? Well, actually, 28 national governments accountable to their parliaments if they wish to. So, I might say that the quality of democratic legitimacy is not lesser in Brussels than it is in Westminster. And don't try to convince me that we have a corrupt set of bureaucrats in Brussels and a good working democracy in Westminster. <laughs> that there's lobbyists in Brussels and since they're all swarmed there, there's no one left in the city of Brussels. That is of course not true. And TP, case in point, yes, it is true. That is the lobbyists working closely with uh, uh, the European Commission who got the project started. But you know what? In order to get it started, the, co the Commission had to ask permission to 28, at that time 27 actually, member states. And all of them, all, gave the mandate. All of them, without telling their population. Don't talk to me about the bad quality of democracy in Brussels and the good quality of democracy in the capitals. All democracies are sick. That is true. But they are sick at national level as they are sick in Brussels. So, so we need to fix them. So I will never say that we have perfect democracy in Brussels and rotten democracy in London, but we have a problem to fix. And, then, and that comes often from the left wing. 
Yeah, yeah, you're right, it's about democratic sovereignty. But actually, the European Union is not doing the right policies. You know, the European dream, well, actually, it was more an act of reason, <coughs> uh, of reason choice than, than a dream, my parents tell me. Well, they were born in 1932 and 1935. They were kids during World War II. And you know, when they tell me about the nascent European Union in the 50s, so they were young people at that time, they tell me it was not part of a romantic dream of unification or that we had uh, become enamored with the Germans who had invaded us. It was an act of reason. We wanted peace. Peace through two things. Extension of liberty and democracy and a shared prosperity. And the left-wing argument against the European Union goes, well, as long as the EU was fulfilling that promise, peace through freedom and democracy and a shared, and I would say today, sustainable prosperity, then we would go along. But this is no longer the case. This is no longer the case, so we should basically withdraw from that Europe since it is a Europe that works for the 1% and not for all of us. But then just let's do the imaginary scenario. You get out on Thursday, but then France will get out and Belgium will get out, etc. What kind of majority do we have in this country? Political majority, I mean. What kind of majority do we have in France, in Germany, in Belgium? Well, the exact same majorities that we had at European level. And that's natural because the European majority is the product of the sum of 28 national democracies. So my argument to those left-wing citizens who are uh, disenchanted with the European Union is it is not the European construction per se, it's the political majorities that we have there. And don't imagine that by withdrawing back to your national democracy that by happenstance, by chance, you would end up with shifting the political center of gravity. So the real challenge is to change policy making at national level, I would say at local level, at European level. This is the challenge, this is the battle that we need to, to fight. And I do believe that it would be stupid to give up this instrument that we have with the European Union that gives us a chance of regaining sovereignty. It is not by withdrawing behind your national borders, behind your national interests, your local interest, that you will become stronger, that we will become stronger. And this is why I believe that the, the case for staying in is, well, you, you, you said, George, that you would vote with enthusiasm, but I would have no hesitation. No hesitation. The challenge remains stall to shift the center of gravity. It won't be a done deal if remain wins on Thursday. Yet, I prefer to fight the battle within a unifying Europe than outside.